Welcome to Café Rolliste, another caffeinated break for you to enjoy, and today I am joined by Zach. Zach, could you introduce yourself uh, to our viewers, please? Hey everyone, uh, my name's Zach. I am known on the internet as Jelly Muppet. I am a role-playing game writer and publisher who runs a publishing company called Soul Muppet Publishing. Uh, we make games like Best Left Buried, East Tech Enterprises, and then sort of publish a bunch of other uh, small press indie games. Um, so yeah, that's and I'm running a Kickstarter at the moment, so I'm here to chat about Best Left Buried and games and things and just have a bit of a lark overall. Great, well, uh, let's hope we'll get you uh, a few uh, more contributors. Uh. Sadly, at the <laughs> moment, I am unemployed and I interview a lot of great designers, so I, I just have a... It's forbidden for me. I cannot contribute to any Kickstarter. So everybody's treated the same. I'm not contributing to any <laughs> Kickstarter until further notice. At least until I get uh, my... Like, I got a Kickstarter, which is very, very late, which I need to receive. I doubt I can receive it one day, but when I do receive it, I will consider doing more. But in the meantime... So we got two ice-breaking questions uh, here, because this sort of spin-off started with the first lockdown. Uh, contribution, uh, no, sorry, congratulations. Right now we're at the beginning of our second lockdown here in London. And also, this is the first episode of a new season of Café Rollist, I realized yesterday. Oh, wow, so I didn't know that. It's the third anniversary uh, this month, so here we go. But the ice-breaking question is, what is your routine like at the moment as you're running a Kickstarter, as maybe you're in... A lockdown to yeah. some extent. Um, so I'm in Nottingham. I'm lucky enough that Nottingham isn't um, isn't too badly affected by COVID at the moment. You know, it's a relatively sort of green amber part of the UK. So I'm st I can go outside enough. I'm not. I can visit other people's houses, but I haven't been. I've just been uh, locked inside the house. I have a day job. I'm very lucky to be. I'm not a full time role playing game writer yet, or that's something I'm working towards. Uh, I'm basically, I write code to do with data, data and stuff. I'm a data scientist. So my nine to five is getting that done. And then I finish work at four, 4.30. And then it's probably on to Kickstarter, talking about it, uh, doing the sort of local, you know, the marketing stuff for the day at the moment. And I try to do that for a few hours, sort of between four and seven is my big peak. And then after I've eaten, I spend the evening actually making sure the book gets made and sort of in meetings to do with various parts of getting the thing together because obviously there's no point doing all the the press tour and the marketing unless there's a book to follow it up which is um, something really important so it, it we're making quite good progress with the project at the moment everything is written and we're still halfway through the Kickstarter about 75 80 percent of the art is done and so the way the project work is working at the moment is that we've got three core books that we're making for the best of buried our fantasy horror game there's a monster manual there's a player handbook there's a dungeon master's guide essentially so the monster manual is is laid out it's done it's ready to go out and then i'm sort of in the process of getting working with the graphic designers to lay out the early bits of the player handbook and i'm sort of polishing up the manuscript for the dungeon master's guide um, so it's all very moving at the moment. And because we're knocking down new stretch goals every couple of days, and there's always things that people are interested in about the project, uh, there's, gonna, there's stuff to do, and there's even more stuff being generated as we smash through those stretch goals. So it's a really exciting time. I sort of, I love and hate Kickstarter months. Normally I'm a lot more relaxed than this, but because so much is going on, it feels like you're doing a new thing every day, and it's not like you're spending six to eight weeks working on a manuscript or you know you got one project that's keeping you sort of in one place you know because it's a this is a big kickstarter there's loads of things happening i can be doing a different job every day uh, which is one of my favorite things about running a small business so yeah it's super varied but a lot of work is happening at the moment and in my spare time i'm painting little bits of warhammer and kit bashing minis so i've got still got stuff going on for my own sanity but uh yeah it's a lot of Kickstarters are intense if you, if, for people who've never done one. Um, so, so it actually uh, uh, ties nicely with our second ice-breaking question, which is, have you picked any new interest or hobby uh, recently? Yeah, uh, I, so I, I grew up uh, playing a lot of Warhammer 
uh, I was a my first role playing game was Warhammer Fantasy role playing. I was well, like eight or nine, and sort of I was interested in. Warhammer isn't that? I mean, uh, a pride of Nottingham is isn't that Nottingham yes, exactly. based? Nottingham's the centre of the lead belt, uh, as they call it, which is where all the uh, the metal minis used to be made. Obviously, a lot of it's in plastic now, but there's still lots of indie creators making things in Nottingham. So yeah, I was a I grew up in Nottingham. Uh, everyone I knew as a kid sort of played a lot of Warhammer, so I got really into it. But sort of around uh, maybe when I was like 16, 18, just about to go to university, I sort of fell out with it. You know, I had a lot of minis and I didn't have a, I, I realized actually once I hit the real world and I had to, like how expensive the, the models were because uh, it wasn't just a thing that turned up every birthday. So I sort of fell out of love with it for maybe like five, six years. and since lockdown i've really i've gone quite heavy into painting and kit wow. and a lot of sort of conversion stuff i'm not very good at painting but i like to think i'm quite good at using plastic glue and snippers to make imaginary creatures so yeah that, that's been my new uh lockdown hobby i've painted 3000 points of admec and then maybe 1500 points of uh, age of sigma sky dwarfs hadron overlords so that's been what's keeping me going. Uh, but it's been really fun. Uh, it's given me something creative to do that isn't writing. So it's a, it's a nice little change of pace. Well, maybe there's a, you can get in touch with our previous guest, who was uh, Emmett Byrne from Cubicle Seven. Oh so, yeah, I know, I know. Emmett. So we were talking about uh, yeah Warhammer and the different role playing games that they have uh, at Cubicle Seven. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I, w I always wonder if I ever will go back to miniature painting, but I, I never was a wargaming miniature painter. I was a, a kid basher, and where is it? Is it somewhere there? Yeah, more. I got one from back in the days. This sort of military oh, miniatures nice. of a somewhat larger scale, or putting together kits and improving them, like like this one. That I painted. It's a it's a it's a kit from uh, for people who cannot see. That's a T forty seven from Star Wars, a, a case no speeder. But uh, I added uh, loads of details and so on. And I've got pff, like three cupboard fulls of models like that. I need to assemble and paint at my mother's place. But uh, yeah, I have no clue if I will ever come to to paint that. Except especially here in London, I have no room whatsoever to have a. A workshop corner or space to 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 yeah f have all of that. So best left buried. How much time you got left on this Kickstarter campaign now? Uh, I think it's finishing. Uh, Thursday, two weeks time. So okay. 16, 17 days left, and we're on about sort of eighteen, nineteen thousand pounds at the moment of our target of ten. So we've overfunded it. We've gone for a couple of stretch goals, and we're sort of looking towards the next stage of um basically stretch goal writers to hire in more um that little one page adventures are the thing that i'm a real fan of uh sort of one of my first kicks well my first kickstarter was a project called a doom to speak which was sort of one page dungeons like literally an a4 piece of paper folded in half with a map on it and then a bunch of monster stats uh, the idea being that um you know if you want to play role playing games and you don't want to have to read a whole adventure book or write something really complicated you can basically read in five minutes everything you need on this one piece of paper and it will run you sort of like a full one-shot dungeon worth of um adventure stuff so the next sort of set of stretch goals we're working on is uh getting loads of those from different writers around the rpg community so um you know i've been flipping through my little roller decks like emailing people like hey can you write some words for me for this project so it's a nice exciting little step but yeah that's the uh but it's it's going well, and we're going to keep hitting goals. I hope and keep making things. So, so uh, I was really a bit confused. How the project's gone? So I, I I've been sick lately. I'm I'm already terrible to sometimes to to properly research my my guests. But on top of that, I've been uh, sick lately. So your current Kickstarter is for Best Left Buried, the whole game, the core books and adventures, or is it for supplements yeah. for Best Left Buried? Yeah. So what we did is we. Best Left Buried has been a game for about two years now. Uh, it's something that it was the first role playing game I ever wrote. It was on sort of a 50 page uh, A5 soft cover originally, sort of like a player handbook. 
and then we've been slowly putting out more adventures for that game since we've expanded it to a sort of we had expanded it last June to a sort of 150 page hardcover book um, that was sort of it was it was good and people liked it but uh, in the last year we've really got ahead of ourselves with how good we've got at adventures and information design and sort of um, quality of layout and print and stuff and I felt I've always felt that the core books that people need to use these other really amazing books we've been making over the last year um, needed to those core books needed to be made to the same level so we've basically gone back and rewrote redone the game from the ground up it's still got the same rules you know it's the engine's not changed it's not like a second edition or something but I've just gone through and sort of polished everything up, like completely redone the layout with a professional graphic designer, gone over the manuscript with like a couple of stages of rules review and developmental editing and copy and line editing to sort of really improve it. And then also just bash out loads of new content. I'm a big fan of sort of uh, toolkits to run games. Like the idea being that Best Left Buried is a 350 page game now across these three books that we're gonna make. Uh, sort of so the length of a, a big meaty role playing game where only like 10 to 20 pages of it are like the core rules that you super need to know and then the rest of it is sort of all these different toolkits that you can um, use to either make a character or to make a monster or to run an adventure or to sort of supplement and remove or add bits from the core rules so you can kind of make the RPG that works for you um, so the book is a we're working on this remastering of the original books so it's going to be three core books a uh, play handbook a dungeon master's guide and then a monster manual and then there'll also be one big book with all three of those small books put together basically and uh now that we've funded that book with our first ten thousand pounds of funding uh we're basically adding just more sets of more like supplements and adventures to work with that book so for sort of one 75 pound pledge that's going to get you a big role playing game and then all the sort of little bits that would come with it. Um, so it w we wanted to just make the game originally, but uh, as we kept smashing through the stretch goals, there's just more and more stuff that we're able to do as part of the project. And that's one of the great things about Kickstarter is that um, the game really can find the demand and the support that works for it. So if people keep being interested about it, I'm going to keep making things that are cool that relate to the game. So that's always the approach and that's what we're doing as part of this um, deeper Kickstarter like really rounding out the core experience of Best Left Buried so it really matches some of the high quality well loved adventures that we've put out over the last year and a half so yeah so uh, I'm I'm sort of working on my own Kickstarter at the moment it's still a long way ahead but uh, one of the advice I got was to try to get as much as possible ready before the Kickstarter even started. Yeah, 100%. So, uh, what is it like for you? Those pledges, those new goals which are unlocked, are these stuff you that you're starting yeah. writing now, or are they pre-written in some fashion, and you you really hope so, to hit them? Yeah, my goal for the, the what you want to offer when you start the project is that you should always, yeah, like you said, you always want to have as much of it done as you can. Not only because you, you you want to have things to show people and that uh, you know you want to be able to talk about what you've done and where the game is you also want to have it be a short time until people get the stuff they want and to minimize the number of things that can go wrong in terms of people getting their content you know nothing would be worse than you know a kickstarter like you said you've got that one kickstarter that never arrived that's because that person didn't do everything they needed to do before they got to it or maybe you know there could be all kinds of problems to do with Shipping. Maybe they started a second yeah. Kickstarter before the first one yeah. was. Well, that's... <laughs> don't, no don't, names. Don't do that. <laughs> Avoid it. No names. It's fine. But yeah, um, what I for the first three stretch goals, um, I had everything written before we started uh, because it was stuff I always wanted to do anyway. Some of it was like a few changes uh, from things that I'd sort of put out previously in blog posts and uh, stuff that I sort of planned to fit in that main book but didn't fit in because it was just so big. And there's only so big you can make a book before it becomes unusable. Uh, you know, if you were gonna have like a five, 600 page A5 book, like that's just not gonna work at the table. And that's what the goal of all role-playing games is to me, to kind of be read and be enjoyed by the person who's bought them, but also, uh, you know, to be usable at the table. And if it's too Leviathan to meet that goal, then 
I've sort of not thought about the game that I would want to play myself. Um, so there's a few bits where we didn't do it. We didn't write it before the Kickstarter started because, um, you know, maybe there was a few things where I sort of wanted to speak to the backers of the Kickstarter and let them know, uh, let them ask them what they wanted to be included. You know, so we did a vote recently about sort of what three new races do you want us to put in this stretch goal that we're working on? Yeah, so maybe stuff like that I wouldn't write in advance. But um, the idea is you want to make as minimal things that can go wrong um, but before you ask people to give you money for it. Because, you know, if you make those kind of mistakes and things go wrong, then people aren't going to back your next project. You know, they're going to go, oh, that guy's not delivered his last kick, so why is he doing a new one? So um, it's definitely important. And there's sometimes you can't control that delivery aspect and there's things that aren't going wrong. But generally speaking, if I... If, if there's something I haven't prepared before the Kickstarter starts, it's either something that's really simple to do or something that I can pay someone else to do so it's not taking my time away from delivering the core books that we're sort of working on. So, you know, these new little adventures that we're planning, they aren't written yet. I've not hired people to do them, but, you know, the, the people who I'm working with, it's a thousand, pay, a thousand words per little dungeon, essentially. So, shouldn't be too much of an issue getting those done and then getting them laid out but obviously it's, it's a challenge um, managing the work for a really big kickstarter and i think the thing you said where you want as much to be done beforehand as you can is a really is a really key piece of advice i'd give to anyone starting a kickstarter like if there are any big moving parts that you have not worked out before you fund then you have to have a really good answer as to why they've not been finished yet um, so yeah that's Coming back to a very long answer to a question, yeah. Well, it's you know it's an important question, and uh, sadly, that every year we got cases which requires apparently us to to repeat that answer. So uh, we need to get the message across for to everyone's benefits because uh, people getting cold feet because they had a bad experience uh, on Kickstarter. It's it's bad for everyone, not just for one campaign. Mm -hmm. huh? But uh, yeah, we, we talked about the campaign, we talked about what's in the campaign, the format and the challenges, but what is best left buried actually? Is it, is yeah, it an OSR, sure is it an indie uh, game, or do you describe yourself? That makes sense. Uh, so Best Left Buried is a fantasy horror rules like role playing game that is about dis discovering the idea of how terrifying dungeoneering would be if you actually did it in real life. You know, you're walking into a cave, it's wet, it's cold, it's dark, there's like gl little glinting eyes in the shadows and chitin scratching on, uh, you know, the cave wall in the distance. That would be scary. And I think it's about exploring the idea of the dungeon as a horror scenario and monsters as a horror element. In terms of what kind of game it is, uh, I think that's a bit up in the air. Like, I definitely come from an old school background, but uh, it's def best of very definitely isn't a retro clone. It borrows from a couple of sort of old school games. The main influences, as I say, are sort of uh, Into the Odd and Maze Rats with sort of little bits of Troika thrown in there as well. But I definitely uh, was playing a lot of story games uh, when I wrote it. Like another sort of influences in the games I like to play. So if I'm in a Blades in the Dark campaign at the moment, I love that game. I was playing Fate at the time. Uh, apparently, I've been influenced by Dungeon World, but I wouldn't know since I've never read or played it. Uh, so it's definitely sort of a um, a mix between old school styles and sort of mechanics maybe lifted from story games. Um, so the big thing about the game mechanically, which distinguishes it from the sort of other old school games, is that you've basically got two resource scores. The first one is your vigor. That's the red stuff. You lose it when you get hit by monsters or traps. It's not particularly interesting. If you run out of it, your character dies, right? Or, you know, or is knocked unconscious, death saves, essentially. But then you've got this second stat called your grip, which is essentially a psychological resource. Uh, it's a mixture of uh, stamina, uh, mana, I guess, because it's used for casting spells, and then for lack of a better word, sort of sanity. Um, and the idea being is you start with this resource and you're going to lose it throughout play. You know, you're going to come across scary monsters, scary environments. You're going to use it to cast spells or use powerful abilities to your character. And then the other way that you're going to use it is you're going to use it to re-roll dice that you don't like. It's a mechanic called exertion. 
So sort of you in a situation where some dice hit the table, you're going to take some damage from the monster. It might kill you. It probably isn't going to, but you sort of have to make that decision. Am I going to push myself and try to re-roll these dice or am I just going to accept what it is? And, you know, usually the answer is I'm going to spend some of these points of grip to stop my character from getting murdered horribly. And then what that happens, what happens then is as your grip score decreases, you're at the risk that it's going to hit zero. And if it hits zero, your character's going to die. Well, not maybe not die as in, uh, you know, get murdered by a monster, but they will probably like have a heart attack or panic or become useless or just run off into the dungeon and join the monsters. Um, and that's a really bad thing to happen to a character. And the things that we do to... The only way you can get that grip score back is by accepting afflictions or injuries. So basically either social role-playing uh, like delusions or personality flaws that your characters are going to pick up or uh, injuries uh, which sort of you know debilitate your characters physically at least temporarily um, and then what happens over the course of play is you start with this group of plucky adventurers who are sort of excited to go into this dungeon uh, and get some gold and what you come out with is over the course of several sessions your characters are slowly degraded and um you know, come out worse for the wear as a result of these psychological horrors. So you, after your first couple of sessions, you know, your thief's going to have a peg leg, your fighter's going to have decided that, you know, the best way to kill all these monsters is to set everything on fire immediately. Your wizard's going to have an irrational fear of rats that may actually turn out to be very rational. Uh, and all these sort of, you end up with these sort of grizzled, almost like black comedy-esque horror-inflicted characters who you know it's sort of it's not very nice but it's also quite fun to role play and it happened i designed the game because in a lot of old school games i found there was too much risk of death and in a lot of story games there wasn't any risk at all and what this was then creating is instead of this boring consequence we're like oh my character's been hit by a monster i'm at zero hp i'll just make a new character now you end up with making these quite interesting decisions about how this character is going to survive and then picking up these uh, traits which at the end of the day are interesting to role play and if they weren't interesting to role play for you you can just pick a different thing that's gone wrong for your character so it, I mean, it's definitely about like finding a middle ground between those two um those two styles of play uh, because i enjoyed both of them and i wanted to create a game that sort of fitted those ideas but that's the idea of the game and what's going on with it uh, but yeah I really like this concept of uh, middle ground because, uh, again, didn't make my homework properly. So when I saw the the art style and and the, you know just the surface of the the campaign, I was like, okay, OSR, BX, something like that. Your your yeah. ability score and so on. And and then you mentioned the other influences, Dungeon World, which I, I really share what you mentioned. Actually, the fact that it's a bit boring if it's just zero HP uh, sort of old style, but I'm also... I'm make a new character. I like yeah. that, you know, what's the threat? You know? and, and at the same time, I share also the, this idea of what, what's at stake here? If I cannot die, if I don't end up in situations where I, I lose, if I cannot lose, I cannot win, I find. And, exactly. uh, yeah. and there's so, also this notion of, uh, which I keep bringing up now, uh, I find... It's interesting how in video game it seems, I guess, obvious to some people, to most people, that you've got you know first-person shooters, you've got games which are click and point, you've got games which are real-time strategy games and uh, action games, uh, loads of different stuff. You got The Sims and so on, and they are they're all video games. And we think, I think, for most people, even even gatekeepy people, it seems normal that you can enjoy some things and not others. And sometimes when we discuss role-playing games, I find it fascinating how things keep being debated in the tone of, oh, PBTA, these are the real games. If you don't share storytelling, you're not playing a, role table t a real yeah. tabletop role-playing game. And you got the others which are, well, if you're not playing it gritty, you're not playing a real tabletop role-playing game. And I'm like, ah, actually, they, you know, there are strengths. Yeah, you can role play first person, be immersive, or you can story tell. Uh, it might be a challenge to do both at once, but you can definitely be one person who leans towards one or another. So it's normal that you got find games which caters yeah. to different things. So, so I'm I was very interested by Dungeon World, which you mentioned, for instance, 
but it leans too much in storytelling for me, and it, it takes me out of the the immersion. Uh, I stop being yeah. uh, my character because I start contributing to the story. So the idea of, but I, I like the concepts of the moves and the way it was trying to do things differently. So I think the idea of a middle ground between that, uh, I find it very appealing, and that's definitely something I, I would like to try. Yeah, it's 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 interesting because I sort of I think that definitely the game leans very heavy on old school aesthetics, like it's the style of art that I want to imitate. I think it looks really cool, and uh, it definitely looks like a gritty dungeon crawler game that's going to murder your characters. But actually, the lethality level is quite low because we've introduced all these other systems that can happen to you instead of um, you just getting murdered. It happens sometimes, obviously, like it should in all role playing games, because otherwise there's no risk. But you're sort of putting your character on this arc, and with sort of where you sort of know what's going to happen to them as over the course of play. They're going to get rich, they're going to get eaten, and they're going to go a little bit crazy. You know, it's just how um, the game tends to happen. I think in terms of the middle point, it's really interesting. I think that um, there's there's a couple of games which sort of um, you know really lean into certain aesthetics uh, and then borrow things from different role playing games from different schools of thought if you will or styles i think that we're in a really great space to explore it as indie studios because um you know nobody's telling me what games to make i'm not trying to appeal to a monolithic first person shooter style audience which wants me to make call of duty 21 or whatever you know i can make the kind of games that work for me and that's one of the great things about being an independent designer and um i think the more that I think about these different schools of thought and whether things are old school or story games or indie games or whatever, it's just a load of nonsense, really. Like, I'm, I'm playing a role-playing game. I don't want to put too many labels on it. Like, if you want me to explain it to you quickly, I can tell you oh, it's, like, a bit dark and grimy and it's a story game but with lots of OSR ideas in it. And then that gets you it in 20 words or whatever. But really, the opportunity is there for us to make all these nuanced games sort of devoid of the context and preconceptions of genre. And I think that while it's good to have things that you do enjoy playing, I would really encourage people to sort of move outside their comfort zone a bit. Like, you know, if you're used to playing D and D fifth edition, then, you know, go and try a game of monster hearts or something. Or, you know, if you're a big Delta green player, you know, try some, something like mothership or, you know, there's all kinds of stuff that you can do in different areas that, you know, games are so diverse and brilliant, and I think that we're in a golden age for the fact that there's so many good role playing games out at the moment. Oh yeah, so many of them are popular, and because of the internet, it's made knowledge of all these weird esoteric games more available than it's ever been before. And also, because you know, one of the good things about COVID is that it's taken us out of our physical gaming groups and it's thrown us onto the internet, and we've been sort of told play games with people. You know, and if you want to play games with the people you were playing with in the flesh before who live in your hometown, great, awesome. I'm glad you can get that game together. But also, if you just want to try something, do some pickup games on the internet with some people on a Discord server. You know, I've got really into Blade in the Dark this this pandemic. That's been my main role playing game I've played, and I never would have played in or organized a campaign with my normal group in the flesh, you know. So I think there's definitely so much room to just try different things. And I think at the end of the day, genre in terms of like pretending that role playing games are filled with monolithic um, schools of thought, it's just nonsense. Like, you know, there's so many games that, you know, cast down and destroy those different ideas of what an OSR game should be or what a, um, what a story game could be or what an indie game or what a lyric game could be. And there's also games which really uphold those traditions and i don't think we would want either of those games to exist or not exist so just play stuff really it's a really exciting time well it's funny it's funny because i had the this the argument sort of my with my uh, with emmet from cubico 7 uh when i was asking about uh cubico 7 is it still an indie publisher or not and uh I've yeah, follow I think I saw that. yeah following the interview I actually commented on that uh, and what i i wanted to clarify is that i I think labels are important personally, uh, not as things which are boxes you don't get out of, uh, and not as things which are 
that you cannot challenge. Actually, it's it's, it's very challenge. It's very easy to find to challenge a, a label. I find, but uh, I find they're important for to navigate uh, the offer which is available because again, there's so many excellent games out there available that it's. I think it's important to have a, some reference point to know how they relate to one another to, to some extent and what they're trying to achieve. So when you have an idea of your taste, you can find markers. But with that said, one thing I'm always a proponent of is to be curious about anything. It show a lot of curiosity. That doesn't mean that you need to get out of your comfort zone at every session. That you, Each session you should try a, a, a different game, but uh, I don't know. It, might come across a bit judgmental, but my view is that people should try something new at least once per year, maybe. Uh, especially if they have several games of the same game system or, or setting. Uh, I think it's it's they're missing out. Uh, I'm not judging them like they're not real players and so on. It's it's not my problem, but I, I personally find they are missing out and they they're not supporting the hobby as well as they could once you you start doing just the same thing all the time. That's my personal view. Uh, it can be someone who does strictly PBTA and turns any game, any IP they like into a PBTA game, or it can be people who are trying to do that with 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons. I, I find it, it's a bit, it's a pity. I, I find it a, a bit sad when you don't, yeah. you don't go out. But uh, you mentioned uh, COVID online, playing and trying a lot of games. I I'm totally with you there. I've played so many. Tonight I'm trying uh, Fate of Cthulhu. It's going to be the first time, thanks to the Gauntlet. I've been trying so many games with the Gauntlet. Uh, I've been making demonstration of my own game, Paris Gondo, The Life Saving of Inventoring, at convention. I'm going to do it at Albacon. Uh, did you seize yourself this opportunity to, to promote, to showcase best less best left period in different conventions maybe conventions like like Gen Con which uh, I don't know what your financial means are like but I know yeah. I could never attend it without uh, uh, yeah, having it no, online uh, it's, it's in terms of conventions like I've been really lucky it's obviously the UK con scene was really vibrant until about six months ago <laughs> I don't know what happened there. Uh, but uh, I used to I got my first role playing game experience at Dragon Meat you know, a really well-loved uh, convention in London in Hammersmith. And I went to UK Games Expo last year as well, and both of them were an absolute joy. Um, I, I've been approached about sort of online conventions and stuff, but I've just been a bit busy over the last few months. I haven't really had much of a chance to uh, get involved, and I sort of can't wait for that con scene to reopen again. Certainly, I don't think I'll be going to Gen Con anytime soon. I can't afford a ticket there in terms of running a stand and ludicrously expensive to get yourself over there. You know, just for one weekend of role playing games. So, uh, something I'd like to do in the future, maybe if I get nominated for all the Emmys, but I think we're a while off that. So, uh, you know, we'll see. I can, a, a, a boy can pray, is what I'd say, but uh, not for a while, I think, especially because we probably won't have Gen Con next year either. Uh, not that I know anything about the Gen Con, that's not like a spoiler. I just don't think that we're going to be in the position where conventions are a good idea for at least another year or so. So, yeah, online versions, they've been really... The, I did a couple of live streams. I was did some... Uh, get some actual plays for... Um, uh, at last at the Virtual Games Expo they did last month, uh, which was really fun. So, um, yeah, since I've not had time to organise anything uh, myself. As a, as just realised I was muted. So what I just said that it was, we got online versions of convention. <laughs> no, no, no. No, I, I, I think I heard you. I don't know if the people at home did. No, the people I, I didn't. Know. I wasn't recorded, so I'm just saying for for oh, them. Okay. <laughs> no worries, yeah. So, um, hmm, yeah. So I've been showing a, a few, on the stream, a few pictures, a few covers from Best Left Buried. Uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned old school type of art. Uh, how did you go about to find a, a an, who's the artist and uh, how did you reach oh, that yeah. artist and uh, or do you, what's your process with that? I see some of them are in colors. I don't know if it's for the room re yeah. re uh, remaster. Yeah. Uh, so all of the art for Best Left Buried is done by my business partner Ben. Uh, I met Ben at school. Uh, we went to school together in Nottingham, and uh, he just did really crazy art to do with monsters uh, that sort of really captured my imagination as a young man um 
there was this one really crazy piece he did which was like for his a level art he did like life-sized ants in soviet army uniforms probably a metaphor for something i don't know uh, and it just really captured my imagination so a few years later when i was coming to put my first role-playing game together i needed some illustrations for it so i approached him and i said hey do you want to do some art he was quite an active sort of political cartooner at the time so i was seeing him drawing things all the time and uh, then he picked up having never played a role-playing game at all i just sort of said draw me some monsters from the recesses of your imagination and um that's where the art for best left braid was born he's now sort of my business partner and is half of some of the publishing uh, even though i do all the sort of administrative stuff and a lot of the writing and the management but he just uh, looks after doing really amazing art which has uh, you know, been really impressive most of it's black and white uh, ben uses a lot of pen and a lot of ink as well um, but there's a few pieces like the covers uh, that you might be seeing at the moment we always do them in cover because i think it really even if you've got an art that's black and white interior it really does well to have sort of a really vibrant popping color uh, just so it catches your eye if it's on a storefront or at a convention you know i think that's really important um i'd like to do full books in color in the future but it just takes so much time compared to black and white art um you know it probably takes ben a full weekend and change to do a one of those cover piece color pieces whereas um and we have to discuss the direction of it for quite a while and talk about the color where he's just in black and white he can churn out like two in a day or something so it's a real difference in volume it's something maybe i'd like to do in the future but um yeah and it's and the important thing about the art for me is that i've tried to keep um uh, i've tried to keep ben away from role-playing games uh, particularly from dungeons and dragons <laughs> because it's really important so part of the thing for best left buried is that monsters uh are horrifying right and um a lot of the the mythos of dungeons and dragons essentially has permeated into the minds of us as role-playing game players so if i tell you what a rust monster is right or a, you know a mimic or a, um you know any number of creatures that exists in your brain is something that's very difficult to scare you with because it's a constant in, a, in the maths of can I take this risk for this next encounter? Can I beat this monster, right? Whereas what I wanted to do was by removing, hiring an artist who has no idea how role-playing games work and asking them to draw a monster, right? I get something that's kind of raw, more imaginative and uh, yeah, not bound by the things that we think are true about the mythos of, mytholo the, the mythology of monsters, right? So it's been really interesting in that, um, if I ask him to draw me a troll, it doesn't look anything like a troll in a monster man you would see elsewhere. It's going to be some weird, creepy, otherworldly creature. And that's quite important for me in terms of preserving both the horror aesthetic of Best Left Buried and also, um, you know, keeping the unknowability of, of the dungeon alive. And then also that mathematical operation where it's easier to scare players if they don't understand what the monster is. Uh, and by removing knowledge basically by making everything a little bit weird um just makes everything creepier which is way which is important so yeah it's a bit yeah. the magic which uh, i personally find call of tulu have lost a bit uh like w one of the the most recent book now is malleumans forum so if uh, as far as i understand it's a monster manual for call of tulu which i understand why people would like to purchase that and, and why cows would like to to sell it but uh, yeah, Cthulhu, you've seen him or it. Yeah. Uh, you can't it... be scared by something that has a plushie, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's been on, on South Park everywhere. Me wrong, but, you know, it's difficult. It's not even, you know, before before it became very uh, uh, a stable house of in popular culture, Cthulhu, you, you had an idea that it looked like that, but uh, I wasn't quite certain. So it was still fuzzy on the edges and... Now you really have the idea of oh, it's a big creature with tentacles in its mouth and and uh, dragon wings and it, yeah it's it's a creature it's it's almost it, it's become zoology it's not it's not a terrifying yeah, creature fear, fear anymore. Of the unknown is just removed completely and you're sort of left to the only scary thing about Cthulhu because the, the scary thing about the Elder Gods in Lovecraft is that they are sort of by nature unknowable and knowledge of them destroys the human mind and causes you know the insanities of all these people whereas actually 
you know, we're just inoculated to it now. It doesn't work. So you need to go in a really different direction. I think that it's possible that Lovecraft has ruined creepy space aliens and gods forever for fantasy. You know, <laughs> until we remove that from the mainstream, it's never going to have the weight it did 50 years ago. And, but um, it's a bit unfair, I find, for, for Lovecraft. I'm not, no, a, I'm not a Lovecraft yeah. specialist, but it, it just feels like for... Uh, oof, I haven't read any Lovecraft for, for a very long time. I don't I don't recall creatures being described as creatures like you got this thing and it's like this animal it was more you were the character were facing concepts you know even yeah. even Cthulhu uh, I don't know in my mind it was always something beyond and maybe you could find depiction of, of Cthulhu but just like you can find depiction of of gods or, or different creatures it's not It's not what it looks like. It's how if you, if you drew it, it would drive you mad. Yeah, exactly. That's how people describe it. The materiality of it, you know. Yeah, But it's it's like when now. it's like the old paintings which would show the the fortunes or the muse, and you got you got you got a lady who represents music, one who represents culture, one architecture. Yeah. That that doesn't mean there's a literal lady walking around looking like that. And and Cthulhu, until it became so big now. Uh, never was a creature. It was mm -hmm. something lying beyond, which could be symbolized by something else looking like that a bit. The, uh, same, the same things happened with a lot of, um, you know, fiction. It's been around for a long time. I mean, and aside from that, if you look at kind of religious imagery as well, you know, in the Bible, the way angels are described compared to yeah, good the example. way they are in the Sistine Chapel, right? one of those things is a lot more monstrous than the other, right? And probably a lot more interesting as a role-playing game antagonist. Unless you want to really subvert the idea of why these seraphs and cherubim are very beautiful and, you know, human in their perfect form, you know. I think that they're, they would be harder to use in a horror scenario. So I think that the subversion of monster mythology is something that is really important to me as a writer. And even in our monster manual, Um, I try to, you know, when I've created a monster, it's always attempted to be this is the blank or this is a template upon which you can create your own creature. You know, this isn't this isn't the stat for a mage or the stat for a werewolf. This is what a werewolf could look like or what this specific werewolf that we have in this part of our fantasy world, how they look. So I think it's really important to you know, rip apart those. If you want to scare your players, right, and that isn't always your objective. Your objective might be our players just want to fight and beat Cthulhu. I mean, if that's if that's what you want to do, then go for it. But if you want Cthulhu to terrify, or you want your elder god to terrify your players, then you need to take steps in that direction to sort of move away from how things are represented in popular culture and kind of throw back or just subvert how they exist completely and come up with your own new thing. So, what would you have for us uh, in terms of what would be your favorite or most terrifying creature that you faced or described in uh, Best Left Buried? Oh, um, well, there's a couple of really standout ones. There's one that we use in the in the adventure, the starter adventure for Best Left Buried, called the Moth Bear, who is essentially not an owl bear, but just a you know, it's the face of a moth and claws of a moth on top of like a bear creature that sort of wandered into our imaginations one day and ben just drew it he's like he was like i said to him oh so it's like an owl bear but a moth and he said what's an owl bear because he didn't know what an owl bear was <laughs> and you were like great dragon. don't look it up great you've you've tapped into the mythos just go but don't read anything about moth bears. And then, bob call the plushy creature. factory i want 3000 <laughs> moth bear by friday <laughs> yeah you got it uh So that's a creature I really like. In terms of the most imaginative that we've ever used, um, I ran an old fifth edition campaign once with a horde golem uh, that was a really, I think that was from Kobold, uh, Kobold Press's Tome of Foes. It's basically a treasure horde that's been animated by a wizard to attack people who attempt to steal from it. Ooh, nice. That's a really dynamic monster in that it is the treasure that it's attacking you with. You know, there's magic swords in it flying around and it shoots spells from, you know, wizard staffs included in it. 
and sort of the idea that it grabs you, attacks you, pulls the valuable items from you, which rejoin the horde. So, you know, your magic sword that you're using to attack it will sort of be ripped from your hand and become the teeth of some terrifying monster. So that's probably, away from Best Seth Barry, that's probably my favourite monster of all time, um, the Horde Golem, because it was just, a, it, was, it, it wasn't something that my players were expecting, right? They're like, oh, we've made it to the gold. There's two hours left in the session. Who knows what could happen now? And it turned into a really big boss fight, basically. But if it was a mimic, right, if it was a treasure chest with a load of gold in it, they'd have gone, oh, it's a mimic. I'm, I'm not going to pick that up. But, but because it was a horde-sized mimic creature, effectively, you actually got the payoff of it. So it's just, how, it's just an example of, of sort of all the things that are important to me about Best Seth Braid monster design, even though it wasn't a Best Seth Braid monster. The sort of unknowability, the subversion, and sort of really forcing new decisions as part of the gameplay. Because, you know, it was a creature, it could sort of vanish into a horde of coins and then sort of rematerialize. It stole magic weapons from you. You know, it was there was loads of really interesting stuff going on with it. And it felt like a really good and really important monster to include in the game. That sounds very cool. Uh, what I find challenging with monsters, it, 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 it's not just monster, but in general, how much do you do you lean on describing what the characters see versus giving an information uh, uh, about something? Like, uh, do you see? Do you say, oh, do you see a kobold, or do you say you see something which is uh, three foot tall uh, with a leathery skin and a snout mm -hmm. like a like a dog? There's a there's a fine balance to find there, and uh, I, I've been also in a, in you know sometimes uh, <laughs> slightly complain to to a friend game mastering because we would enter a tavern and we would say oh you see you see Bob over there who who's uh, an employee of that company and and I'm like how do I know that how do my character know that you you you're actually reading the title of the the character the the npc sheet but it yeah. it doesn't it doesn't make sense that my character would come up and say oh this is bob 35 years old uh, secretary uh, of uh, this corporation and so on well i guess it's about your goal for the for the encounter you know yeah, if you true. want to create something mystifying and terrible and sort of you know unmundane you know esoteric then of course you should um, you know, communicate it in descriptive terms. But I also think that there's a value in the lexicon that we have as role-playing game people, you know. Um, and there's a brevity into the, to that shorthand um, of saying it's a kobold, you know, because it, it's all about w which one creates more, more space for interpretation and, um, you know, sort of imagination as a player in the world because you know maybe you have a really specific we all have a very specific idea of what kobold is right and that actually creates a, a larger um a, and it's also that i guess the other thing is how much knowledge would the characters have of that creature in the world yeah in best they're buried i've always said that all but the most powerful creatures sort of the ones that be in mythology like dragons or demons or angels you wouldn't really know the names of so i i've encouraged people in the book to specifically say that if it's a new creature, invite your players to name it uh, if they want to come up with a name for it and only describe it in those uh, descriptive terms rather than with sort of absolute name tags. Uh, because, you know, but at the same time, if it's something really monolithic like a dragon, then I think that maybe just saying the word dragon is more powerful than describing a, you know, 30 foot long scaled winged lizard that breathes fire, you know, dragon. There's a lot of weight to it. I think there's values in both, depending on the situation, and it's what you're trying to evoke and what your players are looking to get from it. Yeah, what's the focus of the scene? But I really like this idea of uh, having players in character name creatures they encounter. So, or it could be a, a mysterious figure, or if it's a superhero game, it could be the villain rather than have the villain name itself, have them uh, come up with the name, and uh, because then it, even naming it. Is immersive. It's keeping you inside. You're still yeah. on the character, seeing the the gobbly wobbly green thing we fought 
three adventures ago. It's evocative of of what they they've been through uh, in the previous their previous adventures. Absolutely, yeah, agree. Great. Well, we're about to run out of time. Is there anything we missed about Best Left Buried or uh, Soul Muppet that you want to add? Um, I guess the other thing that's quite important to what I do is I do a lot of publishing of uh, indie games and sort of uh, printing and distribution of uh, third-party titles which currently only exist in PDF. Uh, so if you go to the Soul Muppet web store, there's a whole bunch of sort of small press uh, games that you will be able to grab and that list is constantly expanding every couple of months. Uh, and um, I do quite a lot of Kickstarters and quite a lot of, um, you know, creating books and project management and stuff. And I try wherever I can to share the wisdom that I have worked very hard to accumulate with uh, other people, small press role-playing game folks. So if you're uh, a publisher yourself or someone who's interested in publishing, uh, don't hesitate to hit me up. Uh, there's a We have a Discord server, Soul Muppet, where you can not only chat about Best Left Buried and the other games that we make, but also, uh, you know, get really into the nitty gritty of the best way to publish adventures or games of your own. And there's sort of like channels in there where we discuss all kinds of stuff to do with games. Uh, so if publishing is something you're interested in or getting your role playing games out there, um, you know, I'm fairly knowledgeable about all kinds of subjects across uh, printing and distribution and marketing and project management. Uh, running kickstarters customer relations all that kind of stuff so i'd really uh, like talking to people about those and spreading the knowledge so if that's something you're interested in uh, do get in touch and head on over to that discord and uh yeah just generally please head over uh, if you found anything we've said interesting in the last hour to the uh, best of very deeper kickstarter and don't hesitate to ask any questions about the game um, on the social medias Great. I will include links to all of that in the description of the episode. So people go check that description and go click uh, to find Soul Muppet and uh, their Kickstarter campaign for Best Left Buried. Thank you so much, Zach. Uh, thanks, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me on, Callum. It's been, it's been really nice. Well, it's been my pleasure. And uh, worst case scenario, if the pandemic goes very hoary, I know there are very nice ca caves under Nottingham. I visited yeah. some. So uh, I will... shot a YouTube video in one once as a trailer for the Kickstarter, but you couldn't get couldn't get insurance to film that. <laughs> I went to one. It was we. I I went there as part of a conference of urban about urban design, and we went down a, a cave. But you access it through a just a clothing store in the center on the the yeah. high street, and it's. Yeah, it's it's quite unbelievable uh, to to find that. And if you're just a tourist over there and you don't have the opportunity to go through a shop, uh, I believe there's your ye old tavern or the old tavern yeah, that uh, you. Yeah, old uh, ye old trip to Jerusalem. Supposedly the oldest pub in England also has a is is in a bunch of really cool caves, uh, and it's under Nottingham Castle, so sort of where the dungeons used to be for Nottingham. Uh, so yeah. So. Go visit Nottingham. That will be the conclusion uh, of all. Maybe once uh, COVID's please. done, though. Don't, don't go yet. Stay indoors. You're uh, saying that because you're online. not in lockdown yet. You just want to keep people away. That's selfish. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you, see you soon. Yeah. Uh, I don't remember who's my next guest. It will be next week. Uh, and see you around. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thanks, Carl. Bye.